Hi, this is Vivian Vandeveld. I saw a post on the internet that said, social distancing is boring. Exiled for the good of the realm sounds much more interesting. So to all of my fellow exiles, welcome. I'm going to read to you today from Cloaked in Red. Um, in this case, both the hardcover and the paperback look exactly the same. This was a originally published by Marshall Cavendish, uh, which then got bought out by Two Lions Publishing. So I'm going to read to you from Cloaked in Red by Two Lions Publishing. Everyone knows the story of Little Red Riding Hood, the girl with the unfortunate name and the inability to tell the difference between her grandmother and a member of a different species. The question is, why do we all know it? If you look at Little Red Riding Hood, it's a perfect example of the exact opposite of a good story. There are different versions, but they all start with a mother who sends her daughter into the woods, where there are not only, where there is not only a wolf, but a talking, cross-dressing wolf. We are never told Little Red Riding Hood's age, but her actions clearly show that she is much too young or too dim-witted to be allowed out of the house alone. But apparently, Little Red's mom hasn't noticed this. When I was a little girl, my mother was nervous about my crossing the street without adult supervision. But fairy tale characters do not make good role models. Goldilocks's parents not only let her play in the bear-infested woods, they neglect to give her that most basic advice, don't break into strangers' houses. There are other examples of irresponsible adults in fairy tales. The miller in Rumpelstiltskin hands his daughter over to a king whose royal motto is spin straw into gold or die. And Rapunzel's mom and dad trade her to a witch for a garden salad. We won't even get into the issue of stepmothers. So, mother tells Little Red not to tarry or talk to strangers. Not talking. That'll be a big help against wolves. Why can't mother deliver the basket of food to granny herself rather than send a child through dangerous woods into a house with a possibly contagious disease? Maybe mother is trying to get rid of her daughter. Maybe this is the same mother who tried to lose Hansel and Gretel in the woods. Little Red Riding Hood's peculiar name might make more sense in this light. I can just picture the father, not that he ever makes an appearance in the story, putting his foot down saying, Geez Louise, you name our first kid Hansel, you name our second kid Gretel. I'm not letting you name any more kids. We'll just call our youngest daughter after an article of clothing. How would you feel if your parents called you little blue plaid Catholic school uniform? Or little green sweatshirt with a hole at the elbow? And what happened later in life when Little Red Riding Hood was no longer little? Did she shift to medium-sized blue beaded sweater? Did she eventually become size large? And yes, that does make your butt look enormous, jeans? Does Little Red resent her name? We don't know enough about her to say. We don't know enough about the wolf once he comes along to know why he acts the way he acts. If the wolf were hungry, you'd expect him to just go ahead and eat the girl. But maybe he figures it's rude to eat someone to whom he hasn't been introduced. So when he sees Little Red Riding Hood in the woods picking flowers, he starts asking her questions. Apparently, Little Red is quite a conversationalist, because the next thing you know, the wolf has learned everything there is to know about the child, including directions to her granny's house. Still, Little Red is not suspicious when the wolf tells her, you go this way and I'll go that, and we'll see who gets there first. See what I mean about young or dim-witted? So, Little Red takes the long way, and the wolf takes the shortcut, running ahead to granny's. Here's where the different versions come in. In some tellings, the wolf locks granny in a closet not behavior you're ever likely to see on a National Geographic special. In other accounts, the wolf eats the grandmother, in which case you'd expect Little Red on her arrival to notice subtle clues, maybe bits of shredded clothing or gnawed on bones, blood splatters, but maybe Granny is not a careful housekeeper and a certain amount of mess is normal for her house. And sometimes the wolf swallows Granny whole, in which case the wolf must be about as big as a whale leaving us to wonder why Little Red, who seems prone to making personal remarks, doesn't mention this. In any case, then the wolf gets into Granny's bed, which sounds kinky to me, regardless of what he's done with her previously. Then along comes Little Red. 
I don't like to criticize anyone's family, but I'm guessing these people are not what you'd call close. Little Red doesn't realize a wolf has substituted himself for her grandmother. I only met my grandmother three times in my entire life, but I like to think I would have noticed if someone claiming to be my grandmother had fur, fangs, and a tail. But Little Red, instead of becoming suspicious, becomes rude. My, she says, as far as she knows to her grandmother, what big arms you have. Big, she notices. Apparently, Harry and Claude have escaped her. The wolf answers, the better to hug you with, my dear. Aw, how sweet. You'd think that would warm Little Red's heart, but no. My, she goes on, what big eyes you have. The better to see you with, my dear, the wolf answers. Are you wondering what he's waiting for? I'm wondering what, she's, what he's waiting for. My, Little Red Riding Hood says, what great big teeth you have. What would the wolf have done if Little Red Riding Hood had commented on his whiskers or his snout, or if she had simply handed over the basket of goodies? Just how long would he have kept up the impersonation? But either the wolf's just a big joker who has been patiently waiting for the perfect cue to what he knows is a killer punchline, or he's sensitive about his dental appearance. At this point, he answers, the better to eat you with, then leaps out of bed and lunges at Little Red Riding Hood. The story doesn't specify whether the child catches on that she's been chatting all this while with a wolf or if she simply thinks her grandmother's extremely cranky. But at least Little Red finally realizes that, realizes that something is wrong, and for that we can only be grateful. What happens next depends, once again, on which version you're reading. Shortest, The Wolf Eats Little Red. The End. More often, Little Red screams and a friendly woodcutter happens by. Well, friendly to Little Red, not to the wolf. Woodcutter either the, the woodcutter either scares the wolf off or escalates from wood woodcutter into wolfcutter. He cuts the wolf open and out pops Granny. Presumably, she's all slimy with wolf's blood and digestive juices, which you'd think would emotionally traumatize any normal little girl. Then again, there's never any strong evidence Little Red is normal. On the other hand, maybe the reason there's never any mention of Little Red in therapy is because there aren't very many support groups for those who have witnessed family members rescued from the inside of carnivores. In the less messy versions, the woodcutter kills the wolf and afterwards he lets Granny out of the closet. Of course, this leaves us with the question, if Granny were alive and well in the closet, why didn't she say anything when her granddaughter was struggling with the difference between a beast of the forest and a family member? You know, something to end Little Red's confusion. Perhaps something like, Run me a little dipstick before he eats you! In the oldest written telling of the story, not to mention the most bizarre, the wolf swallows both Granny and Little Red whole, then decides to take an after-dinner nap. The wood woodcutter comes into Granny's cottage, we can only guess at the relationship that makes him feel at home doing this, and he sees the wolf's bulging stomach, earning him the Most Observant Character in the Story Award. He slices open the wolf, releasing a grateful, if icky girl, and grandmother. Apparently, the woodcutter is a skilled surgeon because this procedure not only doesn't kill the wolf, it also doesn't wake him up. Then, in a scene that sounds right out of one of those sadistic slashy movies, the woodcutter, Granny, and Little Red fill the wolf's stomach with stones, and then they sew him up. Apparently, these three are too kind-hearted to kill the wolf in his sleep. This way, once he wakes up and tries to jump out of bed, the weight of the stones in his tummy rips him apart. Ew! Okay, think about all this. What makes a good story? One, memorable characters. We've got a mother, Little Red Riding Hood, a wolf, a grandmother, and a woodcutter. It's hard to call characters memorable when the only one who has a name is, in fact, named after apparel that nobody wears anymore. Two, vivid setting. The woods. Okay, are we talking Amazon rainforest here or a couple of trees in someone's backyard? It's sloppy storytelling if we aren't given enough information to picture where our memorable characters are. Three, exciting plot. Try submitting a story to your creative writing teacher in which the main character bumbles cluelessly throughout the story, then gets rescued by another character who was never even mentioned before. Go ahead and keep your fingers crossed for a passing grade. Four, important themes. Something about the subject to captivate our imaginations and connect with those who read the story. It's hard to determine the theme of Little Red Riding Hood. Don't go into the woods. Don't talk to animals who are capable of talking back. If you're going to make fun of your grandmother's appearance, make sure it truly is your grandmother and not a wolf who likes to dress in old ladies' clothes. 
however you look at it. Little Red Riding Hood is a strange and disturbing story that should probably not be shared with children. That is why I've gone ahead and written eight new versions of it. Cloaked in red, be safe be and be kind.